Hey, so you might be surprised to see another wrenching video since I said that the wrenching endgame episode will be the last of the wrenching you'll see for this bike. Yeah, but see, then the apocalypse happened. So just as I was getting ready to move the bike out, coronavirus started getting really bad. You know, not just in the background bad, but bad. So basically, I just sat around for a month just waiting because I wasn't really sure what to do. I was lost in a lot of ways, but the fact is, this project lost all of its momentum just like that. So after 30 days, I felt that the wait around approach was no longer an option. So that very day, I then released the electrical walk around video for the bike. And the next day, I tore the bike down one last time to prepare to move it out onto the road. I then discovered that I put way too much lube on the clutch splines and I flung it everywhere, you know, most likely contaminating the clutch. Also, something at the bell housing was leaking oil, uh, either the rear main seal or the output shaft o-ring. Now I could have said screw it and just slapped the bike together and went on my way, but I decided that I wanted to do things right. Also, also, remember, I was saying that how my brick was experiencing that common issue of the starter sprags not engaging the, uh, the crankshaft, which makes the starter spin independently of the engine. I mean, you'll turn the starter and it'll just spin and the engine won't start. So I left the engine in the shed and the rest of the bike in the basement. So I'll just add that to my reassembly checklist, since I still had that bag of minor OEM stuff to install from months ago. The bike was apart, so why not take inventory and do a few of those things while I wait for my clutch and stuff to arrive. These are vacuum caps for the intake. These are frame hardware, so the bolts for the uh, transmission. And then these are for the, the front at the engine. These actually, funnily enough, these actually, my bike actually has um, the bolts for if you have like engine, engine crash bar. So I just got these all over again. They have other ones that look like this, but I mean, I kind of like the look of these and plus I can kind of turn them by hand a little bit easier. And also the washes that go along with it. The, this is uh, the tank grommets for the back of the tank, which I don't know if they're gonna work anymore because it doesn't line up like stock. The swing on boot that connects to the, uh, the drive shaft. This is a grommet for the injection control unit. This is a coolant neck O-ring. This is a uh, grommet for the timing cover that the um, whole sensor wire passes through. These are bushings for the radiator. That's one of my air filter adapters. This is a washer for the transmission filler, oil filter gasket, and this one is, uh, what is this? But I don't need that because the temperature dial came with its own O-ring, so I don't need that. So I'm gonna put on as much of these as I can right now while the bike is apart, because this is, this is all stuff from that assembly, that reassembly checklist that I made. The tank grommets ended up not working with this new uh, this new setup. My tank has these plastic sleeves on the rear pins, so those will continue to do just fine. Now, I already ordered the clutch and the bell housing stuff, but unfortunately, by the time this absolutely beautiful day of like 68 degrees came around, I still didn't have it due to like coronavirus delays in the postal system. Basically, USPS will shut down facilities along the package routes for intense dis like disinfection, and it's really a luck of the draw if your stuff gets to you on time at this at this uh, period of time. Now, still, I still wanted to do at least some work since it was so damn nice outside. But the important thing to know is that at this point, I was planning to remove the entire bell housing so I could remove and clean the starter sprags. To replace the clutch, you don't actually have to remove the bell, but this was an all-in-one job, or so that's what it started as. Step one: remove the alternator. Step two, the clutch assembly. Now these six bolts and washers have to be replaced every time you pull a clutch out, although it's commonly understood that you could reuse them without incident, but at your own discretion. Now if you're either replacing your rear main seal or you're removing your bell housing, you have to lock the crankshaft somehow because when you get your wrench out to remove either the, either the clutch carrier or the alternator drive dog, the crank and the pistons and all that will just turn like an old Model A Ford. Except, it won't start, it'll just annoy you. Now BMW makes a tool to lock the crankshaft by locking the clutch carrier to the bell housing. But, I mean, good luck finding that thing. I don't even know where you buy that. Some people make the tool by bolting a piece of aluminum with a specific dimension to the carrier and jamming it into the recesses inside the bell. Then there's people like me who just make do with a piece of wood and a prayer. This is the position that you use if you want to loosen either the clutch carrier nut or the alternator drive dog.
Sometimes the alternator dog is seized in there so tight that you might have to use a bearing puller. Other times it's so loose that you could just use your fingers. Mine was a sort of middle ground where all I needed was vice grips. But then something strange happened. See, as I was turning the gear that the starter engages on, in that small opening to the left, I was using my finger. And I was realizing that it was finally engaging with the crankshaft. How? Well, I guess when I was putting reverse torque on the engine to remove the dog, the sprags must have righted themselves. Now, I wasn't fully convinced, so I went ahead and installed the starter motor. The transmission wasn't attached to the engine, so I had to prop the starter in place with a, an even bigger piece of wood so it didn't just spin around, it didn't spin its own body around in circles like an idiot. I attached the negative to the bell housing, you know, to ground the starter since it's internally grounded to the engine. To power it, I just touched a positive to the screw terminal on the, on the starter. And boom, engagement. What would happen before is that the starter would just spin, but the engine wouldn't. Now while I reinstall the dog, let me explain the gamble that, that was the starter sprags. Basically my theory was that since barely any oil really gets up to the, uh, the upper rear area of the engine, odds are the sprags are stopped because uh, the engine was being started over and over in the backyard without, without actually being able to run, like run for long periods of time to heat up the oil and get it circulating. Also at some point I was running cheap Amazon oil which probably didn't help too. Now I personally felt that all the bike needed was to be used. The Sprags have to have enough friction or else they won't grip. It's kind of like a freewheel. It's meant to, to not grip on only the other direction. Now the plan was to simply to push start the bike on the street, you know, start it up, get some miles on it, let the new hot oil and engine treatment clean them out until the starter would finally engage, whenever that would be. But like I said, I noticed that the clutch and seals also needed attention, so that's why I was like, well, I might as well go inside of there. But screw it, I'm not gonna fix what ain't broken. So I put the dog right back on there and I didn't remove the bell. But I still didn't have my parts, so I just spent the rest of the day just refreshing things around the engine, you know, checking torque values. And the aluminum paint was chipping too, due to uh, like gas spills around the, uh, the top of the engine. And trash was collecting on top of the engine too, you know, tape, uh, <laughs> hardware that I just lost track of. And there's nothing that a vacuum cleaner and some touch-up paint couldn't fix. I also retouched the alternator and the starter with cleaner and more clear coat to remove that uh, chalky aluminum corrosion that shows up after it gets wet. The way this thing sat out in the rain meant that it would corrode faster than I could finish building it. But I mean, that comes with the territory. Now I was out of things to do for the day, but I was satisfied. There's one thing that I never did though, and that was to show it was under the seat and in the rear storage compartment when I bought the bike from the previous owner. I was cleaning up the basement in preparation for finally finishing the bike, so I thought I might as well, I might as well show this stuff before I throw it out. So there was a bunch of hardware, more than likely for the fairings, which were kind of falling apart anyway. Those plastic things on the left I'm not too sure about. There was bushings for the gas tank mounts, a piece of trim for the inner fairing, a bulb for something, and a Chinese finger trap? I don't know what that is. A, some kind of strap for something, a spanner and socket, likely from the toolkit that came with the bike, but I'm not really sure about that. More fairing hardware, an unopened gasket that I believe is for the oil filter. The label is rubbed off though. A rain poncho that's still in the packaging, a business card for a bloke at Max BMW, which is actually where I get a lot of my OEM parts, so I wonder if Mr. Drew is still there. A box of BMW licensed tire repair cement for like a tire plug, and then two insurance papers, one naturally for the K100 itself, but also one for a 1968 Yamaha for some reason. Yeah, I wonder what that bike looked like. And finally, an invoice for some parts. So I threw everything away except for these few things. I figured I'd test the bulb to see if it worked. There's no point in throwing away two perfectly good tools. The poncho was unused. I only kept the tire cement because it was BMW branded. And the oil filter gasket was new, so I can use that. The bulb works, so I guess I'll just throw it in my scrap electronics. So then one day came along at 70 degrees. And my clutch and stuff was scheduled to arrive to get to me on that day too. It was a fantastic string of events. So before I even got my package, I went to AutoZone for consumables and got a head start in the morning. I got some cleaning supplies, a Loctite, a nail puller that would serve as a rear main seal puller, a 30 millimeter socket for the output shaft nut, a measuring funnel, 7590 gearbox oil, four quarts of 15W50 Mobile One, which is recommended for the least starter sprag clutch problems, uh, along with a half a quart of Rizlone to help my starter sprag clutch luck even further. I also had a gallon of engine ice, which I had for about a year now, which is what I was gonna run for my coolant. Now, I hate fluid changes, but damn is it nice to see all new everything like this. Now to remove the clutch carrier, once again, I had to lock it up with the wood block. 
Now the wood block broke, but it did loosen the nut, so I just took the bigger piece and continued. Once the nut comes off, you have to remove the shoulder washer behind it. And you can see the leak right here. There shouldn't really be any oil dripping on the clutch carrier. You have to cut the o-ring before you remove the carrier because it kind of holds it on there. It's really annoying to do, but I used a razor and uh, I put some slices on the o-ring and then I used two picks to pull it out. The thing is, it was all cracked and rock hard, so, so it absolutely disintegrated and it came out in pieces. Now this might sound a little bit backwards, but I was so happy to see the o-ring in this condition because this means that the rear main seal just might not be part of the issue here. Turns out it's, it's actually pretty common for people to think that their RMS is leaking when they see oil in the bell housing, but it's more likely to be that little o-ring, which is an infinitely easier to change because in typical BMW fashion, there's a tool for replacing the RMS, which I do not have. Essentially, it's like a drift tool that you use to install a new RMS slightly proud of the, uh, of the uh, crankcase. So instead of installing it flush, it has to stick out a specific amount, which is like 0.5 millimeters or something like that. Now the tool makes it simple, and it installs the seal 0.5 millimeters out from the case, but if you don't have it, you have to either make the tool or manage to find one or eyeball it or just install it flush and hope that you get lucky. But at this point, even though I had the new RMS on the way, I did not want to push my luck by plucking out what seemed to be a good RMS and then end up installing the new one wrong, you know, ruining both. Also, the one that's already in the bike is an updated one. The, the, the old one from like the 80s had a metal face. So I already know that this was this was replaced at some point. So at least I know that, you know, I'm not here to fix what ain't broken. So I went ahead and drained some of the oil from the rear, you know, just enough so that the oil level was before, like below the hole. And then I waited around for my package to come. But even though I was treading carefully and playing the luck in my favor with things like the starter sprags and the RMS, sometimes luck just won't be a lady. Take a look at the story I posted on Instagram and you'll see what I mean. Yep, I managed to get everything that day, but I was missing that one nut. This job was done for now, and I couldn't put this thing on the road during a 70 degree day, unfortunately. It was annoying, but I honestly felt like things were going way too well anyway. <laughs> Luckily, they already shipped apart, so I just had to wait. And wait I did. But then, the piece went from Denver to Vegas? Uh-oh, that's literally further west from the east coast. <laughs> this isn't good. Basically, I waited five days with no update from USPS. It was it was just in limbo. Not only did my last update see that it went in the wrong direction from New York, but I didn't get an update for like five days, so I was getting antsy. May 2nd came around and it was 75 degrees outside on a Saturday, and I still didn't know where my nut was. <laughs> I had to go for a long ride just to get my mind off of it. The ride actually ended up being productive because I took the time to rent out a storage unit in preparation for when I finished the bike, so that was cool. I contributed to the build and I also got to enjoy the weather. Now, Saturday night, my phone buzzes and I get a notification. Tomorrow will be 80 degrees. <laughs> 80 degrees. And just like that, I didn't buy the idea that the nut had to be replaced. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? <laughs> so I start researching. Who has reused this goddamn nut? Plenty of people. Even mechanics have reused this thing with no issue. And if anything, a dab of blue Loctite helps keep the anxieties away like a dose of benzo. I'll check the package tracker tomorrow in the morning and see if there's at least an update because as far as I know, my thing is still in Las Vegas. Next morning, nothing. Screw it. Or should I say, nut it. No. <laughs> I should never say that again. Let's install a clutch. So here are the old parts. Two pressure plates, a spring plate, and a friction disc. Again, the friction disc had a lot of meat left on it, but there was some grease on it from my over lubrication of the splines. It flings off into your clutch and then something that needs friction you know, doesn't need grease. So I replaced the friction disc and simply cleaned everything else with brake cleaner and hot water. I used some lube on the output shaft and the clutch carrier teeth. Don't forget the little thrust washer that goes behind the clutch carrier and it should slot right back into place. Next up, oil up the o-ring so it can slip behind the carrier. Now you can use the, the shoulder washer to get the o-ring to slip behind the carrier, but 
to fully seed it, you have to do a two-step uh, torque process with that output nut. So you get the nut on there, you make sure everything is all lined up, and then you set your torque wrench to 140 newton meters with a 30 millimeter socket. Now my wrench only goes up to 135, but it can read uh, 140. So get your trusty block of wood and just get cranking. Now once you get to 140, you have to back it all the way off, like fully loosened. 140 newton meters is a lot of torque, and the tightening location for the wood block is better than the loosening location. So this means that your wood block might not uh, survive the loosening part. It'll be fine in the tightening, <laughs> but eventually you'll get it off. Once it's fully loosened, reposition your wood for the tightening and then tighten it back to the second stage of torque. You're supposed to do like 95 newton meters and then turn it 60 degrees more out from there. Since I didn't have a torque angle meter, I just went to about 107 newton meters and I used a ton of uh, blue Loctite gel over it. Now I'd like to clarify, BMW says you should replace this nut and I am reusing it, but I do not recommend you do it. It's possible, but I'm making no recommendations here. This is just like legal stuff, I guess. It's your discretion. Since the wood block kept breaking, I made sure to vacuum up all the pieces, you know, in the bell and behind the clutch carrier. I want to keep those in there. Now there's this little ring that goes uh, around the clutch carrier that rides on a spring plate. And you're supposed to loop it up with the same spline loop. Luckily the loop uh, helps keep it in place during reassembly, but it's important not to overdo it with the grease here. So after the cleaning, I reassembled the clutch pack on the bench with the new friction plate. As for the spring plate, you must also loop the perimeter and the retainers in the middle but do it sparingly. Again, don't overdo it and make sure it goes on thin because any thick globs will just fling off like boogers. I found that using a, a wood block to tilt the engine forward helps keep everything from falling out the back if your engine is out of the frame. On the rear pressure plate, there's these little points of contact that uh, should also be lubed up as they make contact with the spring plate. Remember, thin. Might as well get your bolts ready too. You need a method to align the clutch plates, and I already had this tool from last year, but I hear some people know how to do it using a clutch push rod. Now, I still recommend this tool because you don't even have to think about it, you know, just assemble the plates and put your tool right through them. As a side note, BMW apparently balances each component of the clutch. You're supposed to space out the heaviest part uh, 120 degrees from each other, like kind of like you're balancing a wheel to help with vibration. Now, these points, they used to mark them with a yellow paint, but the thing is, these usually fade over time, so so if you want, you know, just telling you before you start your clutch job, you can mark uh, 120 degrees at any point on each corner of, of the three plates. You do it yourself before you remove the clutch pack, you know, just assuming that it's actually still balanced, because remember, somebody somebody could have either took the, the clutch out, replaced the part, uh, put it back, didn't, didn't even care about that, you know, if you can't see your, your original yellow marks. I didn't see those marks, those are long gone, and honestly I didn't really care, as do most people don't really care. You know, especially considering that parts will be have, have been replaced piecemeal and not as a whole assembly. Just make sure you tighten all six bolts evenly, and it kind of takes a while to get them finger tight, so just go slow diagonally. I even torque them in stages, you know, just for my own safety, before getting to the range of uh, between like 19 and 21 newton meters where they're supposed to be. Now since these are new bolts, I torqued them all the way up to the high end of 21. And with that, the clutch job was complete. Now I typically don't show the reassembly process and that's because it's just so stressful. See, the backyard is nice because I can leave my camera out there, I can leave my tools out there, I can leave parts out there, it doesn't matter. But at the front, I mean, even though it's out of the way, I just don't trust people not to take my stuff. So I kind of have to play this game of work, work, work. Okay, now I gotta take the tools in and make sure what's left outside is invaluable, run to get what I need, then run back outside. And then filming would just add another layer of anxiety to it, you know? So I'm just focused on getting the job done. But basically after the clutch job was finished, I had moved everything outside piece by piece and used the rest of the day to focus on torquing and lock tighten. Every single thing I talked to spec because I had to be safe about it. I even put Loctite on a few things as an extra precaution. I wasn't planning on riding a bike anymore that day because I was just getting tired after all this, but I had to do this now before I forget. 
By the time the sun set, the bike was structurally the most safe it had ever been. So much so that I didn't even feel like finalizing the electrics or the fluids. The next day, I spent an hour double checking the electrics and reconnecting all the plugs and stuff. And then I came up with one final checklist of things to do. A couple stragglers for, you know, talking things that I had to look up the values for. A few electrical things here and there. And last but not least, the fluids. Now on May 5th, I completed that list and it took eight hours because, again, I was being so careful. But that same day, I was able to take it for a brief test ride and the ride was successful. May 6th, I took it to the car wash spot that I always go to. And May 7th, I even had the goddamn audacity to ride this thing to a job interview. But in every situation, the bike did not disappoint. Hell, I even got the job I was going in for. <laughs> Nothing but good things all around. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing is officially on the road. Lady 6, the flying brick. The play on the power of the engine at 86 newton meters of torque and the model year of 1986. For now, I'm keeping both the BMW and the FZ1 with the BMW being stored in the storage unit that I told you about. Now, I still have to put the foam pad on the seat, but really, as you can see, I'm not even rushing to do that. I'm going to release the rides as separate uploads very shortly after this one. And then I'm going to get started on some supplementary content, which are five videos I have planned. Number one, so you want to build a K bike. You know, just an exposition on what I learned about these bikes in particular. And I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Number two, the cost of the build, which will break down the money spent on the build since I kept a spreadsheet of it all. Number three, psychology of the build, which is just the ramblings about what a bike build does to a man. Number four, capturing the build, the filming and editing process of the build, you know, scripting, all of that stuff. And five, just some closing words, you know, thank yous, all, all of those things. And because I want to get all these videos out the way, I'll be cracking these out eh, with a bit more speed than what I'm known for. <laughs> After that, I'll simply be vlogging on a BMW as normal. So, hope you enjoyed this unexpected wrenching episode, and hope you enjoy the next few videos. You just watch the Illustrator, and I'll see you on the next one.